reading is from the 38th chapter of Job. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding who determines its measurements. Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. Word of God, word of life. Well, thanks, thanks be to God. God. We'll read Psalm 107 responsibly, starting with the antiphon. You still the storm and silence the waves of the sea. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. For God's mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim the God, and God redeem them from the hand of the foes. Gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north, from the south. Some went down to the sea in ships, flying their trade in deep waters. You still the storm and silence the waves of the sea. They beheld the works of the Lord, God's wonderful works in the deep. Then God spoke, and the stormy winds arose, which tossed high the waves of the sea. They, they mounted up to the heavens and descended to the depths. Their souls melted away in their peril. They staggered and reeled like drummers, and all their skill was of no avail. When in their trouble they cried to the Lord, and they delivered them from their distress. We still the storm to a whisper, and silence the waves of the sea. You still the storm, and silence the waves of the sea. Then were they glad when it grew calm. When you guided them to the harbor they desired. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Let them exalt you in the assembly of the people. In the council of the elders, let them sing hallelujah. 
you still the storm and silence the waves of the sea. Second lesson is from the sixth chapter of Second Corinthians. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on the day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way to great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors, and yet are true as unknown, and yet are well known as dying. And see, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our hearts are wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. Word of God, word of life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, you, O Lord. When evening had come, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind. And he said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you. From God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who stills the storms and calms the seas, bringing peace, even in the midst of our darkest and stormiest times, that our faith may be strengthened. Amen. For much of my life, in times of transition, upheaval, or uncertainty, I have typically trusted in my faith and in an understanding that God had a plan, somehow, somewhere. Through my teen years, when my thoughts weren't always on the same page as my parents, including things like getting my ears pierced or wearing short skirts, I to God and my grandmother, who was wise, about the whys and wherefores of my parents' rules. 
as a young adult in college trying to decide if I should get married and trek off to Japan. Listening, guiding. And as a young mother raising children or a mother of teens and a youth group advisor, God always seemed to be leading the way. Even struggling to this process, I was certain God was. However, in these past few months, I have easily identified with Joe with my why me questions to God. I very quickly learned that there is nothing like losing a spouse for feeling like one is living in chaos and lost in the storm of sea. Like the frightened disciples, many times I have said, do you not care that I am perishing? Our lives are turned upside down in a moment by all kinds of things. In years past, the lives and homes of people in this very area have been tossed about by floodwaters. Others' lives were brought to a crashing halt by the closing or downsizing of companies. And over these past 15, 16 months, we have all felt the chaotic and tumultuous impact of living in a pandemic. Turmoil, disorientation, confusion, sadness, fear, all poured together a swirling of emotions in the seed of life. The people in our lessons today are also in the midst of storms. Robbie with his family and many flocks in the land of Oz, Job is blameless and upright. He, unfortunately for him, becomes the topic of discussion between God and Satan. God talks about how virtuous Job is. Job's friends try to help. They first commiserate with his suffering and then they begin questioning what it is he might have done to deserve God's retribution, even suggesting he might be being punished for some wrong done by his children. In chapter 13, Job starts getting angry and he calls his friends worthless positions. He becomes bitter and anxious and scared. He deplores God in justice that seems to let evil people thrive while he and other honest people are suffering. Questions most any one of us would probably ask if our lives were turned upside down like Job's. At one point, he goes on in great length talking about his own virtues and righteousness. And then we come to today's text where God finally responds to all Job's questions and his pleas for God to please explain God's self. And God responds, out of a whirlwind. He comes to Job within a storm. He says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? We might paraphrase that. Who are you to question the one who created everything? In our gospel lesson, Jesus' disciples are tossed and bounced about in their boat by the wind and the waves on the sea. It must have been quite a storm for the disciples to be so fearful. Remember, a good number of the disciples are fishermen. I'm sure this wasn't the first time they were out at the sea, on the sea, in a storm. Lake Genesaret, or as it was also known as the Sea of Galilee, was well known for its sudden and violent storms. Yet, the disciples appear to be frantic and seem to be sure they're going to drown. Can you just picture it? Huge waves splashing over the sides of the boat, water filling up inside, probably over their ankles, maybe even approaching their knees. The boat is sinking down into the sea. Maybe they frantically try to bail out some of the water. In their fear, they turn toward Jesus, who's calmly sleeping in the stern of the boat. Incredulous, how can he be sleeping? The boat is rocking all over the place. They are being tossed about with no control. And they wake him up. Do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus responds, 
Three simple words. Eat. Be still. And the storm stops. The water is calm. I find Jesus and God's response in these stories to be interesting. Yes, Jesus does calm the sea. But then he seems to take the disciples to task. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? The disciples in the days and weeks before this have been with Jesus. And they've been witness as he taught the people through parables, as he healed the sick, cast out demons, cleansed the lepers. They even saw unclean spirits fall down before Jesus and shout, You are the Son of Man. The verses right before today's gospel say, With many such parables, Jesus spoke to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them in except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. <laughs> Yet, they don't seem to know who Jesus is. Who then is this that even the sea and the wind obey us? Or just maybe they're beginning to really understand exactly who Jesus is. Jesus has rebuked the wind and it obeyed him. Rebuke is a pretty strong word. And it implies that one has done something wrong. It also implies that the one doing the rebuking has some authority. Jesus has authority over the wind and the sea, over creation. It's the same authority that God puts forth in responding to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Does the disciples' awe or fear come out of their awareness that they are in the presence of God? Yes, Jesus stands before them, but Jesus is God. I imagine them also thinking, if that's the case, what now? What does this mean? For a moment, let's go back to the beginning of the gospel lesson. Jesus has been talking to a group of people through all these parables about what the kingdom of heaven looks like. And now it's the end of the day. It's getting dark. And he says to his disciples, get in the boat. Let's go across to the other side. Most likely, they are on the west shore of the Sea of Galilee. Which would mean those gathered are mostly followers of Yahweh. On the other side of the lake, there's Gentiles, those who are not Jews. In other words, those who are not like the disciples, who are mostly Galileans and Jews. You might say that Jesus is taking them from friendly territory to unfriendly territory, or from their comfort zone into the unknown. And as they cross the sea, an unexpected, dangerous storm comes up, and they are tossed about, and they cry out to Jesus to wake up and help them. And of course, he does. But then he says, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Do you still not understand who I am? Do you not trust that even in hard times, I'm right here with you? In the end, Job's life turns around, and God blesses him, and Job comes out on the other side of all the awful things that happen to him in his life. The disciples, too, tossed from side to side in their boat by rough waters and tumultuous winds. Feel the calm of the sea and the peace of a gentle breeze as creation responds to Jesus' command to be still. Jesus' question to the disciples is also a question to us. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Or as the message translation puts it, why are you such cowards? 
Don't you have any faith at all? They will get to the other side of the lake. And there will be new people waiting to hear about Jesus. Jesus' ministry will continue. It won't go down in the sea. And there will be rough days ahead. However, the disciples and all of us are not alone. God is on the journey with us. I'm participating right now in one of the synods flat classes. It's called Dwelling in the Movement of the Spirit, sermons that spark connection with the divine. Barbara Brown Taylor was the preacher this past week, and in one of her sermons, she said, maybe our lives are meant to upset our beliefs. That one sentence has stuck with me it stuck with me as I read our text this week and was trying to prepare my sermon. I suspect the disciples would have liked nothing better than to have a quiet and peaceful sail across the Sea of Galilee. Joe would have preferred that his life continue as it had been, he had been happy, well off, and enjoying his family. I doubt any one of us would have chosen to have COVID-19 descend upon the world and all the disruption, loss of life, and upset it has caused in our lives and around the world. Yet, I have heard and read a number of stories about the good that has come out of our living through this pandemic storm. Our congregations have found new ways of reaching not only our members, but those who are new to the gospel, who have found us on social media or on the internet, on Zoom and Facebook on Sunday morning. Community organizations have found new ways to reach out to the hungry and the homeless. Creativity has abounded. Just this morning, I read about how the mRNA technology used to create COVID vaccines could help treat cancer patients. Imagine that. While some businesses have closed, new businesses have been born. A heightened awareness of our environment happened when things shut down and we could see blue skies. Political unrest has made us take pause and hopefully stop and listen more to those who have different thoughts and perspectives than our own. The heightened racial justice awareness led to President Biden signing into law a new federal holiday, Juneteenth. Federal holidays don't happen very often. And they even managed to close down the federal government on the very first Juneteenth holiday on Friday. Yes, life is filled with challenges, but our Lord and Savior walks in the storms with us. And as our fears shake our faith, Jesus asks, why are you afraid? He reminds us of his words from Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among you. Jesus came to bring the gospel to all people. So he and his followers had to go across to the other side. His message and gift of salvation was and is meant for all people, including those who speak another language, whose skin is a different color, whose beliefs aren't the same, including the lepers and the blind, the sick, the disenfranchised. And it can be messy and frightening. Going through the storms is part of the good news and how we get how it gets to the ends of the earth. The disciples' faith was shaken, but it was also strengthened. Jesus went with them. Jesus even went before them and alone when he walked to Calvary. But his message continued, or we wouldn't be sitting here today. As COVID restrictions begin to dissipate and what we knew as normal begins to return in new ways, it is still for many a scary time. The uncertainty and loss are real. Our communities are the same, but they are not the same. Each of us is the same yet not the same. 
as we have been changed by the experiences of the past 15 months. Our congregations are the same but different. The pandemic closed our doors and gave us opportunities to see our mission differently. An article in the Summer Living Lutheran called Tear Down Magical Doors poses the question, how can we stir up a cultural change that focuses the church's mission on the location of the baptized in the arenas of daily life, family, work, school, community, citizenship, and care for creation. The author encourages us to take our baptismal promises seriously and to live them out in everyday life, not within the walls of our building, but out in the world. Let us respond to Jesus' questions. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? By living in the covenant God made with each one of us in our baptism. To connect the faith we profess in God with our daily lives. Let's step out in faith into the storms of life. And tell others how Jesus Christ makes a difference in our life in all circumstances, and can for them too. Martin Luther defines faith as that in which we put our trust. He also says faith is a living, bold trust in God's grace. In Hebrews, we're reminded, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. Jesus stretches out his arms to us and he calls us to come with him through the storms across to the other side. I leave you with these words of a hymn by George Moore. If you but trust in God to guide you with gentle hand through all your ways, you'll find that God is there beside you when crosses come in trying days. Trust then in God's unchanging love. Build on the rock that will not move. May your faith be strengthened and may you know the peace of Christ. Amen. Amen. We will now join in singing when peace like a river it is well with my soul. <laughs>
Let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostle Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again, who ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now come before the triune God in prayer. <coughs> Holy God, you gather your people from east and west, north and south. We pray for the mission of the church throughout the world, that your steadfast love may be made known to all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You laid the foundations of the earth and the waters of the womb of creation. The morning stars sing your name and all creation shouts for joy. We pray for your blessed creation that it may continue to flourish and magnify your glory. Lord, in your mercy, we keep watch over all nations. We pray for our countries that experience violence, hunger, and unrest. Guide worldwide and local community organizations in their efforts to establish safety and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are close to the brokenhearted and near to those in distress. We pray for all those who are experiencing oppression. Liberate us from the systems and chains that bind us. Remove the barriers that separate us from one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You dwell with us in this faith community. We pray for our leaders and our elders. Grant them knowledge, patience, and kindness, that through their leadership you may be exalted in this assembly. We also pray this day, Lord, for our Bishop John Mockholtz and for our newly elected Bishop elect, we know. In these weeks and months of transition, guide them, be with them, walk with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask your blessings, Lord, on all fathers and father figures of those in our church family, but fathers and those who lead children all around the world. Bless them. We give thanks for their willingness and their time spent to guide and lead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At this time, we invite you to lift up any prayer concerns that you may have.
the Quaker and Rua family, or the Jews family, the great country of America, and all the people who are And Lord, we pray for all those who need healing in mind, body, and or spirit. And we especially pray for Edith, Matt, Carol, Ann, Steve, Mike, Gary, Felix, Barbara, Rose, Peter, Paul, Laura, Jerry, Joan, Eleanor, Jason, Chase, Lauren Jr. and Ernie, and those we name in our hearts or at our before you at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your love, O Lord, endures in all situations. On this Father's Day, again, we pray for those who are fathers or wish to be fathers, for those with broken or strained relationships, for those who are missing their fathers, and for fathers who have lost children. Bless and strengthen them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. 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 May the peace of the risen Lord Jesus be with you all. And I'm also with you. At this time, we pause to give thanks for all of generous sharings of your gifts for the ministry of this congregation of Trinity in Brooklyn. Gifts that help not only the ministries of this congregation, but help your community and the world. Your support makes it possible for us to continue outreach to our neighbors here and far away. Let us join together in the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us join in singing a closing hymn, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. <laughs> Thank you. 
this. I do not like this paper. Are there something on the thing? It's Happy Father's Day to the dads. <laughs> okay. And last call for tidings news. If you could read that second one for the mic. Okay. Let's uh, remember to send <coughs> any information you want in tidings for the July August issue. Uh, needs to be turned in by the end of the day today. Yes. And they can email that to <coughs> that address up there. They know. Tidings at TrinityWorkingWord.org. Okay. So. <laughs> Um, send in your tidings thing for the summer because one um, one issue. You only get one person. chance, July and August together. So think ahead. 